Good afternoon. My name is Juan Luis. I've been working in uh, refugee camps in uh, the north of Jordan with UNICEF to do with the intervention of the refugee crisis in Syria. Quite frankly, it's kind of intimidated to talk to this board because there's lots of professionals with incredible amount of experience. So I don't want to be a dunce of myself and say things that I shouldn't be saying here, but I'll try and give you an overview of what um, the situation in the refugee camp I work in, and in general terms, the situation in the refugee camps and refugees in the north of Jordan, which is where I'm currently working right now. Um, if anybody's got any further questions, I'll be happy to answer them uh, later on. I don't think that uh, the interest of this talk series of sessions is based on the refugee crisis itself, so I'll try and be brief. Um, having heard most of the panelists, I think the, relevant, the most relevant issues that would be pending or that people have doubts about is the legal situation of the refugees. Undoubtedly, the, the situation for the refugees in the refugee camp are very, very bad. We have to take into account that the refugee camps have been assigned by the Jordanian government. It's Jordanian land. The humanitarian actors have been invited by the Jordanian government, such as UNHCR, and therefore the rest of the actors that are helping out in the crisis. So let's say we had to put up with the areas that were given, that were assigned by the government at the time. Um, to give you an example, Zatari camp, it boasts over 110,000 people, which is in terms of size, it could be the size of a regular town in any of our countries, 110,000 people. Now, the refugee camp itself is in the desert. It's in the area called Zatari in Mafraq. It's a very dry area. There are no sanitation services in place. There's no water network. And it's an area of Jordan that's particularly affected by the droughts. So as a starting point, in terms of technical answers to refugee problem and provision of services, it's a great challenge. Um, I'd like to talk about the political situation over there because uh, it's the biggest constraint we're facing. The Jordanian government is very collaborative with us. They're trying to help us uh, in any way they can. However, they've got their concerns. As our colleague from uh, Lebanon was discussing, there's many issues like um, the taking of jobs from the side of the refugees. There's uh, some concerns from the local populations that the resources they're using, such as water, just access to markets are being saturated by the large amount of refugees that are crossing over. Right now in Jordan, there's going to be around half a million refugees. Okay, a third of these refugees are living in the camp. Two thirds are living all over the place, generally on rural communities around the north in the Mafra area. Um, why I mentioned the issue about the political status. We are invited, kindly invited by the government to work where we're working, which is not a place that would be particularly fond of working there because, as I said, it's a desert. We've got other constraints. For example, people are not let in and out the camp. This is understandable because it will alter the local economy a great deal. But people manage to sneak out. So we're finding that uh, a fairly high percentage of the people have managed to find jobs in the areas that are hosting them or in the areas around the refugee camps. We found that, uh, for example, food vendors and uh, businessmen, local businessmen, have got their, um, have expressed their concerns because a large proportion of the aid that is being provided, be it through food aid, be it through all sorts of things that people got to put in their caravans or in the tents are being sold outside. So there is a constraint and a concern from the businessmen on the area. There is another constraint in terms of the legality of the refugees being there. As you will probably know, um, it is not legal for a refugee, at least having just crossed the border. Other countries with a refugee crisis have developed new legislations, but in general terms, people are not allowed to work. Now we're facing the problem in the refugee camp that we've got 110,000 people that are sitting in their asses. Sorry, excuse my English, but they haven't got much to do. So people are bored, people are frustrated, and they're carrying a big burden of what they suffered in Syria. So even though we're trying to come up with some income generating activities, activities that are going to be to enable the people to work, activities that are going to enable people to have an income, we've got the constraint of the Jordanian government that is telling us their legal status is refugees, 
therefore they're not allowed to work. We respect that, understandably, as we would be respecting in any other country. We have to follow the local legislation. What we're doing right now is we're incentivizing these workers under the contractual name of a volunteer to be able to provide their services for a very low wage, which is true, it's a very low wage, but at least we're injecting into the local economy some well-needed funding. It's an argument from the poorer strata of the Jordanian society that in some cases their salaries outside the camp are even lower to the salaries that in-camp populations are getting for whatever, say for cleaning the toilets or for removing the waste from the waste bins. So it's a kind of difficult situation to be in and this is what the humanitarian actors are facing right now. I don't want to go any further because I know there's plenty of people with lots of points to make. So I'll open the floor to any questions later on if anyone has got any queries about this. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Juan. Eh, era realmente un testimonio, eh, diría yo, diario de las dificultades de cada día que suelen ser las más, uh, las más difíciles. Eh, y ahora podemos ya empezar un debate. Si quiere Nadim, eh, si quiere Nadim, empezar. Perdón. Sí, no, one moment, yes, one moment, porque no sé si Nadim, yeah. que es who is the other yes, coordinator. Before, before uh, Yusuf asks, I want to ask Yusuf a question for Juan. <laughs> <coughs> because there is a lot of, there was a lot of de debate about planning for such influx of refugees. And what is the, what, what's the advantage of not planning? For example, in, in Lebanon, the, the refugees can go where they feel they are welcome because they are divided politically as well as the Lebanese are divided politically. So they, they will go to where they have a support. Uh, they, 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 they know they have support infrastructure they, and they know they are politically welcome. They will not get into, in, into, uh, into, into fights. If we, if, we, if we plan for camps and we force them to live in, in, in a certain <coughs> place, how do we know we're putting them in a, in a friendly environment? How do we know that they get on together? And trying to control them makes it even worse because then you, you have the Muhabarat ruling the camp. And so, so when I was, I was present at the, uh, at the meeting in, in, in the Lebanese, with the Lebanese government about a year and a half ago when they were talking with great alarm about the presence of 30,000 Syrian refugees which was going to become 40 or 50 by the end of the, the year and there were 5,000 Palestinians and all the international community was there uh, saying we cannot cope, we ca this, is not, this is too much, we don't have the budget uh, and this was when it was 50,000. So suppose it, Supposing we were an efficient government and we had planned for it, whatever we would have planned would have collapsed by now. And the collapse of a system like that is worse than not having one. <coughs> uh, on, on, so I just want to, uh, yeah, for you, for both of you. I think Lebanon is a big failure when it comes to planning and you know it more than I do. And uh, it has its uh, weight. It has its cost, of course, when you do not plan. Uh, and one can understand why is it that Lebanon does not plan. It is a, a special, if you wish, case within the third world framework. We never had import substitution policies. We never had the five-year plans. We had an understanding of a laissez-faire economy, which was very laissez-faire. Uh, this is the philosophy, the rhetorics, the visions. But again, you cannot plan when the security situation and the political situation is so volatile. In Lebanon, every now and then, you have an unforeseen on the security level, on the regional level, on the internal level. So planification needs a time horizon whereby one can more or less 
if you expect uh, the future with more or less certainty. Now, this is, the cost has been that production is very costly in Lebanon. The cost has been that infrastructure is not adequate in Lebanon. The cost has been that the government was not able to assist in Lebanon. But it allowed Lebanon a lot of advantages. Because of this lack of planning, Lebanon has a more vibrant private sector with all due modesty uh, than, than many of other countries in the region. And uh, uh, it has given Lebanon resilience. The, the private sector and the public sector and civil society can react to unforeseen more efficiently than if you had planning. I remember in the 80s when we had hyperinflation, you had small enterprises of 10 people, 15 people, who had to work with the Deutsche Mark, with the Pezetta, with the Yen, what have you, at a time where the Lebanese lira was like a yo-yo. And then they were able, and, and, and the, or the Syrian border would close overnight. And yet they were able to manage because they were not planning. So yes, it has its cons and pros. We cannot have, I think, it's a personal, although many people would disagree, uh, 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 how do you say, uh, uh, camps in Lebanon. It would be very dangerous, as Nadim said, so many uncertainties and very sad, if you wish, uh, possibilities uh, when it comes to security that you don't want to create camps. And, but, and anyway, the Lebanese would not accept it given the 1948 camp. Now, my question to you is, as a community of 100,000 people or so, one can engage into some kind of micro activities and there is enough economies of scale to have people, you know, create their own enterprises within the camp, not outside the camp, to sell, to buy, to do this or that. Have you, I'm sure you have considered it, and are you planning to execute it or not? Wait. So it's really an easy answer to your question. All the income generating activities that would arise from business exchange inside the camp would depend on external exchange of supplies and money. Yeah. So the, there's two issues here. If the government or the local representatives of the government are willing to facilitate that, and if the people in the camp themselves are capable of organizing themselves into a structured market structure or into just some sort of uh, business collective and business set of representatives that are capable of running this. Right now in the camp I'm working in, again, over 100,000 people, the system is not structurized. And this brings around lots of problems between vendors, between the local security, which is very weak, and the rest of the humanitarian intervention. Thanks. Oui, oui, pardon, salam. Uh, concerning the camp in Jordan, it's true that uh, officially the Hashemit uh, institution take 20% of the humanitarian help and in official uh, and uh, informally they take uh, 50% about a uh, question about the percentage of the help, because they tell me uh, officially that they it's 20% uh, in their uh, argument that the 20% from what coming as help is to to uh, try to develop the Jordanian uh, village around the camp to uh, try to stop the tension between the Jordanian uh, population and the camp population. But the people inside the camp told me that they, they took 50%. It's a huge amount from the first question. The second question, when the Jordanian, I was in Amman a week ago, and the Jordanian, they declared that 50,000, 56,000 people, they chose voluntarily to go, go back to Syria from the camp. Uh, how you look on this uh, information? Because from my side, nobody can choose to go back in such situation, especially those who come from the Dara region, and when it's uh, still uh, under uh, daily uh, bombarding. And uh, if I, I wonder, I don't have any answer, but if 
it's possible to to have this decision for 75 or 7 uh, 57,000 people to decide to go back to Syria or it's something uh, forced by Jordanian authority they it was their choice to to go back my question it's it's normal to have uh, such choice in th such situation? Okay, regarding your fir qu first question, um, I've got a technical background, I know into politics, so I'm afraid I can't give you specific figures if it's 50%. I know there's a general concern of the Jordanian population that some of the funds are not well spent. I cannot answer if 50% goes to the Jordanian Hashemite organization, which is, I believe, the Jordanian organization that you're talking about. What I can tell you is the Jordanian Hashemite organization left the camp around two months ago. They were told by their own government to retreat because the situation was getting very fragile, mainly to do with issues of security. So I can't give you an answer. All I can tell you is they're not present in the camp. However, they're working actively in outside communities. Outside communities have got massive needs. Like, for example, someone pointed out the renting of flats to ensure that the people can have a living. In some cases, people are living in abandoned buildings, so there's no walls. It's freezing over there in, some, in winter, and it's very hot in summer. So they're giving uh, plastic bags, they're doing uh, water provision, food aid. I know that interventions happen outside, but I don't know if the funds are well spent or not. So I can't answer really your first question. Shall I go into the second, or do you want to add something regarding the first? Up on this question? Please. Um, regarding the 50%, uh, the, the 20%? 50. Well, actually, uh, the rule is that every project that is targeting Syrians, it should target host communities and uh, Jordanian vulnerable population. So the uh, Ministry of Local Affairs is requesting that every project that we're, uh, they are implementing, it should target at least 30 to 40% uh, the uh, population, the Jordan vulnerable population. And this is the case, what's happening also in, uh, in Lebanon, but this is not imposed by the government, but the uh, NGOs and the international community uh, providing assistance to the Syrian refugees. They are also providing to the uh, host communities in order to absorb, because in Lebanon there are you know, I mean, the, the poor people are more, maybe they are more vulnerable than even the Syrian refugees. So in order to absorb their frustration and their, uh, uh, their anger, they are also targeting uh, those. But in Jordan, it's a, it's a rule, it's a regulation. If you want to implement a project, you should target the host communities, the vulnerable co people, uh, at least 30 to 40 percent of the budget. Yes, thank you, Amani. It, it was very clear. Second. Okay, uh, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Okay, in regards to the second question, um, for example, from the refugee camp, there are buses daily for people that want to go back to Syria. As you pointed out, most of the refugee population are from Dara and from surrounding areas. So it is a fact that lots of people are returning. Now, there are several reasons why people want, would want to return. One of them is the conditions in the camp are not good enough for them. So this is a statement and this cannot be discussed. Some people dislike badly the situation in the camp. A refugee camp is a refugee camp. The idea is it's there not to please anyone. It's just a temporary solution managed in however better possible way it is to keep the people living while there's a conflict in the country. So this is a, an issue that's, it just happens like that. People don't like living in refugee camps. Second one, they've got communications with relatives of there back in Syria. What I know is that in many cases, if the conflict has moved slightly to another area, people would be happy to go back to their homes, to go and protect their businesses or look after their houses, to avoid any possible militia, faction of any army, or just other populations that have been displaced to make sure that it doesn't be, it, it's not occupied. So, um, and thirdly, well, I actually mix point two and three. It's the businesses issue. One of them is going back to make sure that the houses are well kept and if the whole family can go back, they'd rather go back. And the third point is males. Males will go back for one of two reasons. One, to watch out businesses 
to make sure that the shop is not looted. And the second one, in many cases, to fight. So they will walk with their families, leave their families in the refugee camp, and then they will go back to do their thing in Syria. So there is an influx of people going back, and uh, IOM, which is the International Organization for Migration, are facilitating this service by providing buses every time. There is a small faction of these people that abuse the system by going to the border and then getting registered again and obtaining all the goodies that are provided upon arrival, which has an amount of like $50, $60. So this is also some sort of uh, activity that's ongoing over there. Thanks. Muchas gracias, Juan. Es muy explicativo sobre la vida diaria que de efectivamente suele ser muchas veces dramático y uno va a una no sabe muy bien si dejar su casa destruirse o quedarse en el campo o irse es es la vida misma de una guerra civil eh, pero ahora tenemos que concentrarnos un poco que nos queda poco tiempo en intentar sacar no sé cuatro o cinco conclusiones que podemos colgar en la web por ejemplo y en esto Najim que sabe mucho va a dirigir el debate Entonces, ya podemos eh, empezar, sí. Sí. Thank you, Jumana. Okay, now, we've had, it sounds like, it feels like we've been here for a week debating Syria. And if someone is going to ask us what are our conclusions, what are the, what, what have we learned, and what, what is the, what is the uh, uh, direct or what recommendations can can we can can be can be brought out from our from our discussions? Uh, first of all, I would define what are the issues one would want to have recommendations on, and I think one of the issues that came out clearly uh, is a disagreement over the role of the international community whether the international community should intervene or whether it should keep out and allow the Syrians to reach a solution on, on, on their own. I think that that was a, a very clear, clear theme. The other is about the interpretation of the narrative. There, is, there were two conflicting narratives in the room, uh, each leading to different policy conclusions. And uh, what I recall is whether uh, the view of the opposition, uh, the, the opposition, whether the opposition was uh, a viable political entity or not, uh, whether its division is good or bad, uh, whether it's controlled by uh, the Islamists or, or, or not. Um, I think a lot of a lot of the questions were that we dealt with showed the split in in the, in the narratives, uh, depending on which policy policy recommendation one 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 one, one takes. Uh, if I were to summarize them, I would say that one narrative says that Syria is in a sectarian civil war that uh, uh, the Islamists and the Al-Qaeda are dominant, that it, it has become a proxy battlefield for regional and international interests, that, it's, uh, that the priority is to stop the violence, stop external interference, and allow for an internal dialogue between the different factions to resolve the, the issue. I think this was one sort of dominant uh, uh, trend. The, the, the opposite trend, if I can also summarize it, is that Sir what's happening in Syria is a revolution. It's not a, it's not a civil war. It's not sectarian. Uh, the, 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 the violence is only a result of the regime's actions and the lack of protection from the international community and the vacuum created by the lack of protection. So this other narrative asks for 
intervention from the international community and help because they consider that the population is being massacred by its own government and they need protection. Uh, this same narrative says that Jabhat uh, al-Nusra uh, and all that are partly the creation of the regime because the regime opened the uh, re released them from prison knowing very well what, what, what would happen, partly a result of uh, what someone called outside this room uh, a Spanish civil war phenomenon when there were people, poets and <laughs> artists and people from everywhere coming uh, here. Uh, there's the hotel where Hemingway used to sit. Yes. El Palace. El Palace. Yes, we can have tea there. So, so the, uh, par partly, partly that, and partly solidarity from other Arab Spring, uh, spring countries. So, there, but that it is not a dominant phenomenon. Also, that the chemical weapons story is uh, a bit exaggerated. It's a. It's a. Um, red herring created by the West and that it doesn't know what to deal with because it's, not, it's, it's, a, pre it's a red line that was created by the Americans. You, you called it, uh, you said, sorry? Pink line. Pink line, yes. That it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a red line that they created which had a lot of implications because when you say it's okay that you should never use uh, chemical weapons. That this is a red line. It means that everything else is permitted, in a, in a sense. You're giving you're giving the regime a green light to, uh, well, maybe 200, 300 a day is fine. If you go up to 500, you get a little slap on the wrist. But basically, Bashar al-Assad had the the blessing of the international community to control this. We spoke about. There was a lot of uh, discussion about Geneva, Geneva two whether Geneva II is timed correctly, whether it's capitulation to a stronger uh, side, uh, stronger negotiator, whether it reflects adequately the situation on the ground, and uh, whether the opposition is going to go or not, uh, and whether it can go and participate in a united way. And um, here I want to ask people f from the floor if they want to add to these conclusions, because each one of us has learned different things uh, from the, 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 the meeting. So if anyone has, uh, apart from the recommendation also of, uh, of uh, appointing Ambassador Aguirre Ben Goa as negotiator with the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. We, yes. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Bueno, yo como palestino y después de tantos años de lucha y ante la pasividad de, de la comunidad internacional, podría decir que lo que está pasando también con la, eh, la revolución eh, en Siria es algo más o menos parecido a lo nuestro pero bueno, que ellos llevan solo muy pocos años comparados con los que hemos pasado nosotros a lo largo de los 65 años de sufrimiento. La pasividad eh, pues de la comunidad internacional, aunque sigue hasta hoy en día, pero la hemos podido eh, de alguna manera combatir eh, a través de mejorar la imagen de la revolución palestina. Eh, y yo creo que cuando más eh, nos metimos en la violencia, menos hemos podido obtener eh, apoyo a nivel internacional. Eh, algo parecido, eh, claro, en este caso yo no culpo de ninguna manera la oposición eh, siria porque ha tenido que recurrir a las armas, pero entiendo de que también tienen deberes que hacer. O sea, no, eh, no cabe solo echar la falta a la comunidad internacional y decir eh, que el radicalismo es un resultado de esa pasividad. 
Yo creo que ellos tienen que trabajar también en su propio país, en su, eh, en su propio frente, eh, a través de aislar a esas fuerzas radicales que ahora están aprovechando de la situación de Siria para fortalecerse y establecer un régimen que ya sabemos qué aspecto va a tener. Esto, eh, si creemos que el Yesh el Hor, el ejército libre, si las fuerzas de oposición siria están controlando de verdad el territorio liberado, entonces tienen que hacer algo para que eh, esta, este frente eh, de Al-Qaeda no pueda seguir disfrutando de, de las condiciones eh, de hoy en día. Eh, y esto eh, pues, se, se tra puede traducir luego a mejorar la imagen. Yo creo que una de las de los razones de, de que hay pasividad a nivel internacional es eso, que hay un radicalismo eh, tremendo en cuanto a las fuerzas de oposición siria. Yo creo que no solo a nivel de la comunidad internacional, eh, yo puedo decir, eh, sin sentir culpa ninguna, que en Palestina misma, hoy en día se oye algunas voces de, que dicen, pero ¿qué, vamos, ¿qué estamos haciendo? Estamos apoyando a alguien que va a ser a lo mejor peor que, que Bashar al-Assad. Eh, antes no se oían voces así. Todo el mundo el, al 100% estaban con la revolución siria. Hoy en día mucha gente empieza a sospechar de qué es lo que va a pasar. ¿Cómo vamos a terminar? Si Bashar al-Assad eh, se va y viene un Samahed Sheikh, ¿no? O sea, eh, cambiamos a un dictador eh, por otro, pero con, con, pero con otro turbante. Eso es lo que eh, tienen que pues, eh, eh, empezar a hacer, eh, yo creo, eh, y se lo digo como hermano y como ciudadano palestino, árabe, que pues, eh, está esperando el día en que todos los pueblos árabes puedan disfrutar de libertad y democracia, porque así podemos nosotros también como palestinos acercarnos hacia nuestro objetivo final, que es la liberación de nuestro territorio. Gracias. Eh, muchas gracias, Raúl. Eh, sí, Anas. Lo siento realmente de la, de la comparación que has hecho. Realmente no se puede comparar para nada entre, entre lo que está pasando en Siria y lo que está pasando en, en Palestina. En Palestina era un estado ajeno, en cambio en Siria es un estado del mismo pueblo. Está el régimen sirio matando a su pueblo, en cambio el otro lado que no es lo mismo. Y aparte de eso, yo creo que en poco tiempo, el tiempo que ha pasado, se ha matado, no es el doble, se ha multiplicado, por tanto, en Siria, eso no, no ha ocurrido en, en Palestina. Y aparte de eso, volvemos otra vez a hablar de radicalismo en Siria. Y no sé si, si habéis visto también el, el grupo de coalición siria que hay. Yo creo que no hay ninguno conturbante. El presidente de la coalición es cristiano. O sea, no sé por qué razón volvemos otra vez a meter el miedo de que detrás de Bashar al-Assad vendrán los radicalistas de, de, de Siria. No, no, eso realmente no lo puedo entender. Estamos enfocando todo el tiempo que eso detrás no hay, no hay mejor que Bashar al-Assad. Incluso del pueblo palestino, que antes eran, vamos, estaban con la revolución, ahora parece que ha cambiado la situación. Pues no lo entiendo por, porque, porque realmente que están cambiando la situación en Palestina que sabemos perfectamente que el presidente Bashar al-Assad nunca se ha afrontado durante el ni él ni su padre. Durante 40 años no se ha afrontado con Israel. Entonces, no entiendo por qué realmente el pueblo palestino está o no está. O sea, quiere decir, por favor, el, la idea de ese de, de radicalismo la tenemos que quitarnos de, de la mente. No, no sé por qué razón volvemos otra vez a, a, digamos, a, for, a fomentar esa, esa, esa idea que es incorrecta. Los, los sirios no son radi, radicales. El, el, los musulmanes en Siria son moderados. 
pero cada cada día y cada eh, año que pase de la revolución están fomentando el radicalismo en Siria. Además, yo creo que socialmente es lógico. Gracias. Um, gracias, Anas. Pero es que, no sé, pero hay muchos informes de, de organizaciones de derechos humanos que están hablando ya de exacciones de parte de unos grupos radicales en las zonas que se dicen que son liberadas. Luego hubo, me parece, un vídeo donde había un radical de estos que comía un hígado. O sea, hay muchos indicios que parecen indicar hasta la misma, los mismos revoluciones sirios reconocen que tienen algunos grupos radicales infiltrados. O sea, entiendes que Raúl, la verdad, me parece que la sugerencia de Raúl es muy sensata, muy sensata. Eh, muy sensata. Eh, luego quería añadir un punto más eh, que no hemos añadido en las conclusiones la eh, urgencia de la crisis humanitaria, porque daos cuenta que desde el año 48 estamos viviendo una crisis después de la otra. O sea, en esta zona del mundo, que son, son tres o cuatro países, o sea, hemos pasado de Palestina, luego al Líbano, luego a Irak, luego ahora de nuevo a Siria, y hay países que están ya al borde de, unos países como Jordania o Líbano, están ya al borde del colapso en cuanto se trata a la recepción de refugiados, a tratar con ellos, además que se supone que, o sea, esto también es muy importante, a añadir a, a, a nuestras conclusiones. Estamos en una crisis humanitaria muy grave, o sea, y, y que va empeorando, eh, en creciendo. Esto me parece que se ha debatido muchísimo en esta mesa. Uh, okay, I think uh, one can also say that we did have this dilemma between the humanitarian action and the political action in the sense that, as Jumana now explained, the humanitarian situation is quite uh, bad and it's urgent to be, to be dealt with. But the humanitarian situation was bad two years ago and it was bad six months ago and it will get worse if there is no political solution. So I think there are two uh, priorities which people have been emphasizing. One of them is that there should be a political solution as quickly as possible, which would stop the source of the problem, of the humanitarian problem, rather than uh, dealing with the, with the symptoms of the, of, of the, uh, of the humanitarian <coughs> problem. And uh, also the, the role of the international community, which is paralyzed, what does it mean? What does it mean for, uh, that the UN cannot act, that the EU cannot act, that uh, no international organization is able uh, to intervene or have any action to stop what is happening in, in Syria? What does this mean for the next crisis, if it's too late for, for, for Syria now? Uh, we've, we've already learned a lot from uh, Bosnia, from Kosovo, from Lebanon, from Iraq, from... Uh, so what are the lessons we, that we are to take with us from this Syria crisis? Because it's so obvious that if there had been an intervention two years ago or a year and a half ago, things would have been much better now. So the risk of non-intervention uh, and the cost of non-intervention is probably far um, it, it far outweighs the risks, the risks of in intervention. In, in that. Uh, yes, Hala, please. Um, so I think, Jumana uh, and Nadim, that uh, we need to add uh, uh, at the conclusion something like scenarios. Because in, uh, in such uh, crisis, uh, as I said, it's not limited to its domestic uh, uh, borders. But uh, now we have many actors. And I, uh, I believe that uh, because uh, no one can reach the zero-sum game uh, or to, to eliminate uh, uh, its enemy, 
uh, concerning the international and regional uh, actors. So uh, the solution will be will evolve around something like a win-win situation. So we have to put scenarios. Uh, how much uh, uh, America will share power with uh, with uh, Russia, for example, or how much space uh, will leave to Iran? Or because I think until now. Uh, uh, the international community is hesitant to uh, inter to intervene because of uh, of the lack of uh, clearness uh, concerning the alternative. So now we need to put uh, some scenarios. Also, I think we should include the uh, the stance of Israel as well because Israel will be very influential. Uh, even indirectly, and uh, the recent uh, strike against the military, some military target in Syria, uh, this deliver a clear message to Hezbollah, for example, that we won't allow uh, these uh, uh, missiles or uh, these weapons, Syrian weapons, uh, to be uh, at the end in the hands of uh, an extremist or terrorist um, uh, movement like uh, Hezbollah. So, uh, and this will be very influential on the uh, on the, on America and the European uh, community because I don't know what we mean by international community. We do not have a coherent uh, or uh, a unified. Uh, uh, unified uh, stance vis-a-vis -vis this uh, uh, this crisis. So that's what I, uh, I, I yeah. The last thing, the last thing I forget because I wanted to uh, to comment on uh, Salem on this, but I didn't have the time. Yeah, yeah, I I didn't have the time. Uh, the domestic scene and the division between. Uh, Syrian political uh, powers, parties, uh, movements, I think need to be more elaborated. Uh, we, we, we are talking on uh, about something like unknown, the opposition, the Islamic, the non-Islamic, uh, but even the, organ the armed organizations, we want to, to make a kind of classification. Uh, who is working with whom and against whom? Uh, do you have uh, and the Islamists, for example, you have the Muslim Brotherhood, but you have Salafis as we as we have in Egypt and in uh, Tunisia and now even in Turkey. I mean, I mean this uh, this scene is very the domestic scene is very important in order to uh, push uh, the the international community, what they call the Western. The opposition. the opposition and the armed now the armed factions is very important, very important as well. Because in Syria, you cannot talk just about the opposition. You, can, you talk about the Gish al Hor, Gabhet al Nusra. Of course, there is big difference between them because I don't want to get into this. And a big difference between them, but you have all this. And also, uh, Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda is Al Qaeda really involved in, uh, in what is going on in Syria? Uh, there is uh, something on the border. At least in Egypt, I know now that in Sinai, there is uh, something called Al Qaeda functioning and working. So uh, this would be very important. Thank you. Uh, thank okay. you, Hala. Uh, un momento. Uh, one moment, because Pedro, I uh, want to see Pedro want to talk. Yes, he didn't. Bueno, yo creo que en toda guerra, y sobre todo en toda guerra civil, eh, hay una tendencia, bueno, pues que es natural, a la simplificación entre buenos y malos, y naturalmente siempre depende del lado eh, del que se considera o se informa sobre ese tema y sobre todo de quién es el que hace la mejor campaña de comunicación. Quiero decirles que el próximo domingo empieza en Monte Carlo el festival de televisión más antiguo del mundo. Es un festival de televisión eh, en el cual se presentan documentales de actualidad. Yo soy el presidente del comité de preselección y en el mes de abril hemos visionado cerca de 200 documentales de los cuales hemos dejado 16 finalistas, que son los que van a competir. De esos 16, 5 se refieren a Siria. Y quiero decir que mmm, puedo avanzar, que probablemente el público se va a sentir muy impresionado por algunos de ellos, especialmente uno que presenta la RAI, en el cual eh, está rodado del lado de los rebeldes y donde hay algunas imágenes eh, absolutamente espeluznantes, imágenes que se suelen producir en toda guerra civil donde alguien, es decir, un jefe, eh, invocando o sea, obviamente eh, el nombre de Alá, eh, ejecuta uno por uno hasta 16 eh, miembros del gobierno. 
imágenes que son verdaderamente vomitivas, bueno, pues la gente por lo menos, eh, los eh, políticamente correctos no están muy habituados a verlas. Quiero decir con esto que en definitiva esto va a provocar una emoción tremenda y que a la hora de la verdad y de enjuiciar el, el tema de eh, blanco o negro en toda guerra civil me parece que no que hay una gama de grises intermedia que es la que va a matizar. Y por eso me parece que, la, que desde el punto de vista de los no sirios o de los no implicados en la región, los matices son verdaderamente importantes. Y lo que significa la comunicación y, de alguna manera, la propaganda también, va a tener muchísima influencia en el desenlace final. Gracias. ¿Tú querías hablar, Pedro, el embajador? Ah, bien, bien. Yes, yes, of course. And he, I am afraid that in the conclusion uh, we lost all the day and all the, what we learned on the day when we heard about, uh, uh, or we repeat the same stereotype concerning the definition of what happening in Syria. If after 10 hours of work, uh, working and discussion we return to the, defini the initial definition, it's for me a negative issue. In all, uh, I invite you to not, it's not black and white, it's not question to choice between uh, um, criminal regime and between population who fight for his lib her liberty. Uh, under the regime of P Pétain in France, The resistance, uh, the French resistance, who is now very, in, in the book of history, is very positive image. They used also to have some uh, worst uh, uh, comportment, and it's not uh, with this image of the, this person who killed, I don't know how many, we can judge all a revolution and we can consider that the, uh, we don't uh, have clear image and we, don't ca we cannot distinguish between the black and the white. We have a black and white and we have many between and it's the between, uh, it's uh, open space, Syria now. You have all the people who can uh, make uh, atrocity and uh, Jumana, she, uh, you talk about the Humanitarian, humanitarian organization and their report concerning the, the atrocity from both sides. In the uh, international law, and uh, it's very clear, we don't have, we cannot consider what's happening from the side of re, uh, the rebellion as uh, 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 war crime. We consider it as individual crime. crime. It's not a massive crime. I don't defend the, the atrocity from any side, but when we kill 600 person in one day in a village, you cannot put that in the same level when you, you have a, a, a criminal person who revenge his family and who kill a soldier. It's, it's not fair for anybody. If it was fair, You, I, I, I ask you an, another time again to remember uh, uh, the 40s and the 30s in, in Europe and to, to stop to say the things are not clear in Syria. Please. It's very clear. Sí, Ana, sí. Yo creo que el tema es que tenemos que decidir sobre una cosa tan sencilla. Yo creo que el señor Bashar al-Assad, después de lo que ha hecho durante dos años y pico, de matar a más de 100.000 personas y ha acabado con 70% de la infraestructura de Siria, yo creo que este, esta persona no puede estar, lógicamente. O sea, tenemos que decidir realmente, ¿este hombre puede seguir gobernando o no? Si nosotros hay alguien en el mundo que puede aceptar un, una persona, un presidente, 
que acabamos, que ha hecho durante ese tiempo todo lo que hemos visto, de matar y de destruir su país, si alguien dice que sí, entonces bueno, pues entonces no, no digo nada. Pero yo creo que por lógica, por todo, no, este hombre no puede seguir, ni él ni su régimen. Entonces tenemos que partir de ese punto. Este hombre tiene que ir con su régimen. Y la potencia mundial occidental, eh, sobre todo, tiene que ponerse de una forma para, con, para convencer al otro lado, otro bolo del mundo, que este hombre no puede seguir. Y por ese camino tenemos que irnos. Hay que eh, convencer de una forma, yo no lo sé, no soy político, hay que convencer que este hombre no puede seguir en el, en el, en el poder, ni él ni, ni su, su régimen. Tiene que ir de este camino, plantear los pasos que hay que seguir. Y evidentemente, antes que vengan los radica radicales sirios, no sé dónde están, si forman 5 o 10 por de, de la población, antes que venga esta gente, por favor, formar un gobierno de todos los grupos de, de, del pueblo sirio que gobierne el país. Adelantar los pasos. ¿Alguien más quiere intervenir? Uh, Karim, sí. Um, I think tra trying to, to um, collect from, from Salam's intervention and from the previous ones, there is probably a need to, to specifically mention then in the conclusions the points that he was raising, that you know, the, the current regime is, is unacceptable Uh, despite the facts that that the international community, in, in brackets, whatever that means, uh, be it, uh, and I think there is a need for that, for a proper mapping, of we are we seem to be at 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 odds with who is the opposition exactly, but we we seem to be at odds with who is the international community exactly. We said it all comes down boils down to Russia and the United States. Is that so? Then where is Qatar? Where is Saudi Arabia? Uh, they said they were they were arguing that how can Turkey be now the representative of the Sunnis? Uh, I mean I don't know if that's exactly precise either. If if then where where is where is Qatar and where is Saudi Arabia? What are the roles? So on the one hand there is a clear need to say that the Assad regime cannot go on. Uh, on the other hand there's a need also to map out who are the actors that are essential for the for the uh, for the next phase uh, because i don't think it boils down only to washington and moscow uh, there are a number of other actors that need to be explicitly earlier we had an ambassador who said i don't want to um say what qatar roles because it it uh, it begs for prudence uh But I think there is a need to say that, to actually discuss exactly with, with details uh, or map out at least who are the actors who are involved. You, you know, where is Tehran and where is uh, Doha and where is uh, Riyadh? And uh, if we don't have this map, then we're still in a state of confusion. Despite the simplicity of it all, I don't think it's that simple. I mean, I think. The, 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 the current crisis seems simple of what's uh, at odds in Syria, but obviously there's a lack of, of clarity in where are the, the, um, what are the mechanisms to, to, uh, to sort out this, 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 this trouble. So I think mapping, saying, saying things clearly, but trying to map it out <laughs> in order to reflect the complexity of, of the situation. Um, uh, see. Perdón. Sí, sí. Eh, eh, creo eh, que de todos los presentes aquí eh, nadie apoya a Bashar al-Assad. O sea, todo el mundo sabe que entre ellos y no quieren que haya interferencia y han impedido cualquier interferencia externa. Esto es lo que he leído en los periódicos, quizá me equivoco. Pero bueno, yo no soy rusa, de cualquier modo. Pero eh, aquí no, el, el debate no es sobre si apoyamos a Bashar al-Assad o si apoyamos a la oposición. El debate es cómo cambiar el régimen en Siria. 
Eso es lo que a mí me parece que ha sido el debate hoy y ayer también. Y, y Pedro lo dijo muy claro. Él dijo, más vale que no interfieran las potencias exteriores. Otros dicen que no, es mejor que interfieren las potencias exteriores. Otros han dicho, queremos que nos dan, preferimos seguir en la guerra. Otros dicen, no, es mejor una solución negociada. Eh, terceros dicen, bueno, como Raúl dice, hay que dar, o como Hala dice, tenemos que ser, la oposición tiene que ser más transparente. O sea, todo esto se ha debatido, pero en ningún momento, eh, Karim, u, u, u Ana, su Salam, nadie está apoyando un régimen que está matando a su gente. O sea, mm, eh, o sí. sea <risa> hay que no, ser no. realista. O sea, nadie lo ha hecho en ningún momento de esta jornada, porque vemos muy bien cómo es el asunto. Nada, pero dejo a We have to say it clearly that the Russians are supporting the regime that is killing its people, supplying it with arms, and uh, b uh, stopping, uh, you know, uh, sabotaging every effort to, to, to counter it. And so is Iran, so is Iran, with arms and with fighters. So why, why should we hide and say that Russia has uh, good intentions by... <laughs> no, no, I mean... Uh, I mean I'm talking, uh, uh, yeah. I'm just talking uh, what yeah. uh, they say in their uh, own uh, uh, discursos, o sea, not saying anything else. And here we are not Russian and we are not American. No, 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 we are just a group of people yeah. discussing. And, okay, uh, we can say Russia uh, uh, is supporting the regime. Uh, well, we mi think militarily, that. Militarily, logistically, are not, uh, diplomatically. Uh, Uh, there is nothing left yes, for it yes. to do. Yes, yes. Every, every, each country actually has a different position yes. in, 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 for, uh, in front of the, what is happening in Syria. And we can, of course, we can, uh, but I, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to do, um, to write a conclusion. I mean, yes, yes, here yes, yes. nobody said that he is no, uh, supporting not, is uh, a, Assad. A, a, yeah. Creo que ya son las cinco, yes. eh, que está ya todo el yes. mundo cansado, eh, que uh, hemos debatido, la verdad que ha sido muy, muy interesante. Y uh, bueno, es, eh, es siempre eh, cuando... Estamos en el caliente, como se dice, que estamos en plena guerra. Hay que ver las cosas. Es siempre muchísimo más complicado y más confuso es entender de entender todo. Y esto llevará... Esperemos que el derrame de sangre ya se para ya y que se encuentre ya por mí mañana mismo una solución. Y sería fantástico, sea lo que sea. Y muchas gracias por todo el mundo y hasta la próxima. <risa>